heavenly experiences, it's just like contemplating eternity. We just can't. Our little human brains simply don't have the hardware to <laughs> to fully understand what is going on. But really, through through all of Gemma's visions, just love came through, definitely, as, as the baseline for all of them, the true essence of charity. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Young saints give me great pause for reflection. I always admire their ability to be so certain, or rather to listen so obediently to God's call to them from a young age. St. Gemma Galgani's life is no exception. Her diary has all of the rantings of a young Catholic, living the struggle of attempting to live in perfect love and union with Christ. To choose to leave the worldly life and to enter into a deep spiritual life, full of its pain and grace, heartbreak and loneliness, longing and desire for heaven and sanctity. It is striking and inspiring to read about the intimate conversations she has with Jesus, Our Lady of Sorrows, and her guardian angel. Sometimes I even felt a bit too close while reading this book, almost a voyeur into what saints must endure to purge themselves of sin while still living in a human body and striving for the beatific vision immediately after this life ends. In St. Gemma's case, who died at just 25 years of age, we really get a sense of how much the stigmatist wanted to enter into Christ's sufferings, to gladly wear and feel the pain of his crown of thorns, and write about the experiences at the request of her spiritual director. In her diary, we have a raw and honest document of what it took for her to become a saint. And joining me now to talk about this wonderful volume uh, from Sophia Institute Press is Kristen Van Uden. Kristen, welcome back to the Focusing Hi. Way, Way is Love podcast. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me back. I was uh, really excited to, to read this volume because uh, young saints always fascinate me, how they come to sanctity at such a young age. And um, I'm just, I want to start off by uh, maybe, can you tell the story about the condition this diary is in and how it got that way? Yes. So the story and the journey of this diary is proof positive that God willed its existence for the salvation of souls because it has been through quite a lot to come here to be in our hands today. Uh, St. Gemma was ordered to write her diary and autobiography at the age of 21 by her spiritual director. So the first half of the book is a recounting of her life up until that point. And then she made more or less daily or weekly entries from then on until her death. And she kept the diary in a drawer in her room. And as we'll discuss later, one of the mystical visions of Gemma's life included visions of demons who would come to physically assault her. And the worst thing that they did was try to tempt her to sin. And this is why she's the patroness against temptations, part of the reason why. And so... On one of these occasions, a demon ran across the foot of her bed, and she thought nothing of it. She's like, oh, there's another demon. She prayed. She, <laughs> she at that point, was used to them. They were annoying, but she, she knew how to handle them. And it yelled out, war, war, your book is now in my hands. And it stole the manuscript. And it disappeared from the drawer. Her spiritual director, I'm not sure exactly how he caught wind of this, how it had happened, but he was not in town, but he decided nevertheless to perform an exorcism over the manuscript from where he was at a separate church. After he had done this, the manuscript was returned to the drawer and it was completely singed through. So there's photographs of this. It's amazing. It's completely burnt, but all of the words are still preserved. So we haven't lost any of the content. They've all been preserved so that we can read them, but These are considered to be the fires of actual hell, where this demon was keeping the book, but even through his conniving and and theft, he was not able to destroy these words. God protected them so that they can continue to help souls. Yeah, I'm just going to read the quote of what uh, her spiritual director said, and it's, quote, The pages from top to bottom were all smoked and parts burned as if each one had been separately exposed over a strong fire, yet they were not so badly burned as to destroy the writing, this document having thus passed through a hellfire 
is in my hands, close quote. Yep. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, I'm always kind of fascinated by the awareness of young saints, like that they come to sanctity and uh, they're so decided. Um, and we see this in St. Gemma's first communion resolutions. Um, can you just talk a, a little bit about her awareness at a young age and what that teaches us about her sanctity? Yeah, so one of the things that we often encounter reading the saints in their own words is you come away from these readings thinking that they must have been terrible people because they are so hard on themselves. They're so quick to accuse themselves of any small fault or imperfection or sin. And this is because they possess or are approaching the possession of perfect contrition. So, of course, we know that that is a contrition that is sorry for sins, not just out of fear of hell or an intellectual understanding, but deeply rooted in the knowledge that these sins hurt Jesus and uh, just complete acute awareness of that pain that they caused Jesus and a resolution not to hurt him. And Gemma had that. She, especially because she was granted mystical visions of Christ, she could be painfully aware of how each of her sins, each of her temptations and defects was wounding him. So she was ultra aware of this. And this is something that the role of her guardian angel in her life also brought to the forefront. So we can go into examples of that. As for her first communion resolutions, this is even very, very early in her life. So I think it's before her mystic visions had even begun. I'm um, here on page 21, her first one, I will receive confession and communion each time as though it were my last. It's just a beautiful thought. Wow. Number two, I will visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament often, especially when I am afflicted, always turning to him. Three, I will prepare myself for every feast of our Blessed Mother by some mortification, and every evening I will ask my Heavenly Mother's blessing. Four, I want to remain always in the presence of God, so making your life a prayer even when you're not engaged in prayer. And then finally, five, every time the clock strikes, I will repeat three times, my Jesus, mercy. And these, it's incredible. And I yeah. think she's like nine years old when she makes mm -hmm. these resolutions, right? Mm -hmm. They show a complete seriousness about the faith even then. And of course, she goes on to say that she uh, forgot these <laughs> sometimes yeah. at the end of this chapter because she, you know, she accuses herself of that. Of, oh, I made this resolution and then I didn't follow through always. But she continued to reinforce this commitment to this zeal in, in different ways throughout her life. Yeah, she had uh, her life circumstances. Uh, you know, let's just talk about the time period there. We're talking about early 1900s. And um, there's a lot uh, happening in her life and the state that she's in while she's writing this diary. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what she was struggling through? Yes. So both of Gemma's parents died when she was relatively young and she was sent to live with two aunts and kind of a revolving door of extended family. So various cousins and siblings would live there with her. And throughout her life, Gemma always felt that she had a vocation to be a passionist nun. There was a local passionist convent, which I believe is still there. And she had gone on retreats and taken classes there and felt very strongly that this was her vocation. But because of her poor health, she was not able to actually join the convent. So we see that that means that Jesus had given her this vocation, but he was calling her to live to almost a, a higher vocation through her mystical union to him. And the fact that she had to live this out in the world actually made it much harder for Gemma because there were more distractions than if she were in the cloister, less opportunities to attend daily mass, more afflictions. And one of the struggles she went through was the hostility of her family towards her sanctity. Mm. Her younger sister, Angelina, in particular, would prove to be a great cross in Gemma's life. She would harass her constantly, make fun of her. Um, she would even go to the point of distracting Gemma so that she could not recollect herself in the deep prayer that would be required to go into ecstasy. So she was really trying to be a roadblock to Gemma's vocation in any way she could, just out of the spitefulness. Um, the, some of the one of the aunts was was good and, and protected Gemma, but she ran into this with a, a brother as well. And so it's mentioned a few times in the diary, more so in her letters. But at one point, her guardian angel had to block the door so that Angelina, her sister, couldn't get in, and Gemma would be able to pray. And so 
she takes all of this humiliation and abuse from her family members and she offers it up. And we can see that she was really united, not only through receiving the stigmata, the physical wounds of Christ later in her life, but also in this humiliation that he endured, this social, emotional, and more spiritual suffering where it's like, bless them for they know not what they do. Her family didn't understand what she was going through uh, and what exactly this phenomenon even was. And if they did understand that, that makes it worse because yeah. they were acting against God. But it's uh, those type of immaterial sufferings that made it more difficult for her, but she pushed through. She had physical problems too, which we often also see in, in the saints where they go through arduous physical trials, uh, almost as though they have to understand or participate physically in Christ's suffering. Uh, but she talks about moments in her life where she's like literally unable to even just only can only pray in bed. Um, can you just talk about a little bit about those physical struggles? Yes, her health was so poor that she wasn't able to enter the convent, mainly because she had spinal meningitis earlier in her life. And then we'll see later she develops tuberculosis, and I believe that's what she dies from mm. eventually. And so she describes at one point this back brace that she had to wear that had like 34 different places of attachment to the spine. And it sounds awful, just a metallic like yeah. turn of the century torture contraption. And this is why she's patron of uh, back pain or those suffering from back pain. And so these ailments afflicted her so that she was not able to make it to mass as often as she wanted. And then later on, when she was given the stigmata, some her working with her spiritual director, she had to place limits on what she could do on the off days, so to speak, because her health only allowed her to do so much. So when she had the stigmata, it was from Thursday evening to coincide with the beginning of the Passion with the Agony in the Garden through Saturday morning. So it was temporary, um, but it was suffered weekly for a period of, I think, three to four years at the end of her life. But on the other days, her spiritual director ordered her to remain in bed because she... Um, Obviously, Jesus, Our Lady, and her confessor knew that Gemma could only take so much, and she offered up all of the suffering in perfect accord with God's will, but they also made sure <laughs> that yeah. she didn't die from it. And her guardian angel at one point, um, he, we can go into examples later of how he served to really be a presence of tough love in her life and to admonish her. But we also see that he comforted her. Uh, my favorite anecdote from the story is after a particularly bad night of suffering, her guardian angel brought her a cup of coffee in bed. So yeah. <laughs> he knew when to console and encourage her and then when to you know, tell her to get in line. There, there are incredible stories about her guardian angel. And, um, but just to, I want to just read a little quote about how she gets hard on herself. We, we always, in, in modern times, we kind of criticize uh, ourselves for being hard on oneself. But, you know, this is just a small quote toward the end of one of the passages. And she says, this is in St. Gemma's words, quote, and this has been so true because Jesus has always protected me in a special way. I have treated him only with coldness and indifference. And in exchange, he has given me only signs of infinite love, close quote. It's like she can't love him enough. And mm -hmm. uh, what was your sense of that while you were reading this volume? Did you have that feeling as well? Yes, and that particular passage stuck out to me as well because it re reminds me so much of the epitaph under the Sacred Heart, right? Um, I, I can't remember exactly, but behold this heart that has so loved men, but in return is only met with... Indifference, um, yeah. Yes, indifference. And that's exactly the sentiment that Gemma is expressing here is that she understands the infinite love of Jesus' sacrifice and how her ability to love him back utterly pales in comparison and this um it, it doesn't discourage her but it just prompts her to love him more and more and to offer more sacrifices and she at one point begged him to be able to offer um these sacrifices for a soul in purgatory and jesus granted her the knowledge to know when that soul actually flew to heaven afterwards so she was able to see the efficaciousness of her suffering but this this overflowing love for god translated as it does with many if not most of the saints into a desire for holy suffering which is 
you know, incomprehensible <laughs> unless we are truly dedicating ourselves to, to adopting that mindset and adopting the will of God every day. Yeah, you mentioned, and, and at times when I was reading it, I was like, wow, her guardian angel is really tough on her. And we don't really expect our angel guardian to be one that is reprimanding or scolding, but he's obviously always doing God's will. He's always in service to God first and doing that, you know, as a ultimate benefit to the, the soul, in question and that's the other thing we talk about there's the person and the soul and when when we get into these kind of conversations it's really important to remind everybody that these are people who are entering into sanctity and they're really getting into the nitty-gritty of their soul and that eternal part of themselves that's going to live on through eternity and they're doing it in a human body during this time on the planet, right? And that's why it maybe seems so otherworldly when you're reading a volume like this. It's like, some of it's like, well, wow, what is going on here? Can you just talk about some of the moments you may have experienced when you were going through it? Yes. So with her guardian angel, particularly, when you think about it, his role is ultimately to get us to heaven. And he loves us so much that he can't stand for us to sin at all <laughs> because he wants it to be as easy for us to get into heaven and spend as little time in purgatory as possible. And it's funny because this is also the role that Jesus and Our Lady would play. Even they would admonish Gemma. And she uh, hilariously says that Our Lady was the hardest on her because she wanted her to be perfect. So she... Um, there's a line where she says something like, Jesus is more eager to forgive than Our Lady is. And of course, they're both equally willing to forgive and Our Lady subordinates her will to God's, but also she wants Gemma to be perfect. And so she was employing these means like any good mother <laughs> of, of punishing her or, um, you know, pointing her in the right direction. And it's just, it's just perfect. Uh, Jesus refers to Gemma as so little that she needs direction. She really was like a, a child in the arms of Jesus and Mary. And her guardian angel first appeared to her um, in, I think, 1895. And this was to admonish Gemma for an occasion of vanity. So this is Gemma's predominant fault, which as holy as she was, she self-diagnoses vanity and the temptation to worldliness as two struggles that she encountered. Mm -hmm. And her guardian angel saw that she had just been gifted a gold watch with a chain and she had been parading through town, kind of showing it off to people who would look not necessarily sinful in and of itself, but he reminds her very seriously in his words, remember that the precious jewelry that adorns the spouse of the crucified king can only be thorns and the cross. And from that moment onward, she threw away, or she didn't throw it away, but she took off this chain. She took off another ring she had been wearing even and swore to avoid all occasions of vanity. And her guardian angel also in so many instances in the book, um, points her away from vanity so he points her away from a, a worldly conversation her sisters had been having with their friends which again not necessarily sinful but taking away from the great vocation she was called to it would just distract her and would take her mind off heavenly things and bring them onto earthly worldly concerns and the one that really stuck out to me was how God used the removal of an objective good in her life to bring about a greater good in the realm of defeating vanity. So Gemma would often go on almsgiving walks. She would take what scraps she could from um, the pantry at home and any money her parents or her cousins had and go out and give to the poor. And this is an objectively good thing. It's a corporal work of mercy, of course. But her spiritual director forbade her from doing this. And it was for health reasons, number one, but also number two. And Gemma herself says that through this, Jesus worked a new conversion in her. It was because these walks were an occasion of worldliness for Gemma mm. because she would leave the house and she would meet all these people, have worldly conversations, joke around, make friends. Not necessarily bad in and of itself, but it was just kind of shifting the paradigm 
for her and making it harder for her to then re recollect herself and devote herself to the life of prayer to which she was called. So she can see in the end, and in her words, she says, this caused me to stop caring about clothes and all those other things. She just let the vanity completely wash away after that occasion for temptation was removed and trusting that her spiritual director and Jesus knew better and that something good would come out of giving this up. Yeah, and as a young girl, she also took any money that her father gave her and would, like, wherever she was going, she would just give it away. She would she would mm-hmm. always be sure to come home without any money. That was when her father was still alive. But one of the things uh, you're talking about is, um, I, and I'd like you to get into this a little bit, about what do you feel her diary teaches us about sin and sanctity, mm-hmm. because it, it really gets you down to the nitty-gritty of sin. You used the term worldliness a few times. And what we realize reading her diary is that, you know, even even occasions of, you know, chit, idle chit-chat or conversations or small encounters are occasions for sin. And when Christ is calling someone like her to sanctity, um, he, he realizes he doesn't want her that those kind of opportunities for sin. So can you just talk about what her diary teaches us about sin and sanctity? Yes. So first of all, it's a strong reminder of the seriousness of sin, because I think in today's culture, we have a tendency to be lax about sin and to let it slide and to make excuses and sort of project our sins. People look for absolution in all the wrong places. They would rather be affirmed and or find some legalistic loophole to continue in their sin instead of just repenting and leaving it behind. Um, it calls to mind that in the C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, there's a, a scene where a man is holding on to like a little red dragon, which represents sin that he's attached to. And he, he really loves the sin in a disordered way. And he's unwilling to let it go. But when he's convinced to let it go and to kill it, it turns into a beautiful white horse that runs away. And that's so much better than an evil little dragon. And so it really reinforces that we must crucify our sin and, and stop sinning. And it is so serious, not only for our own souls, but also because it wounds Jesus and Gemma's just clear imagery and communication of that fact alone, I think is very convicting um, to anyone reading this book. Then I would say also she did on the other side of that struggle sometimes with scrupulosity Mm. and she especially struggled with, even if she was in the state of grace, feeling unworthy to receive the Eucharist. So she came to an agreement with her spiritual director at one point to go to confession three times a week and then to receive three times a week as well. And her guardian angel admonished her on this point as well about scrupulosity because At one point, she had gone to confession, but she still felt such a great sorrow for her sin that she did not go to communion. And her guardian angel basically told her that that was itself a sin of pride, because if the priest in Persona Christi had forgiven her sins, then if she still held on to them, that was trying to override the will of God. And what God has told us occurs in a good confession. So her guardian angel convinced her to to let go of this false attachment um, and this this remorse, which had gone too far in this case, and to trust in the structures and the sacraments of the church. And she was able to overcome that. So it was a, we have to find the, the balance between over laxity and over scrupulosity of that sin and make sure we maintain vigilance, I think, we in today's day and age we definitely tend more towards the laxity than the scrupulosity but when you're trying to work it out it's easy to overcompensate and to fall one way or the other and Gemma provides this perfect path this mean down the middle yeah she's she's such an example and uh i could see how you would have related to it um to this book and we've talked about how incredible her, her relationship is with her guardian angel but i mean here is a person who would lament sometimes because Christ wasn't coming to see her and it was only going to be her guardian angel. Just think of like how many people would just like to have the relationship with their guardian angel or to be able to see them. But I'm just going to read this quote um, uh, about her, you know, which kind of forms her relationship with Jesus. 
This is uh, St. Gemma Galgani, quote, He usually blesses me before leaving, and in fact he lifted his right hand. From that hand I then saw a ray of light shine forth, much stronger than a lamp. He kept his hand raised. I remained fixed in watching it. I could not get enough of him. Oh, if I could make everyone know and see how beautiful is my Jesus. He blessed me with that same hand he had raised, and he left me. After this happened to me, I wanted to know the meaning of the light that shone from his wounds, in particular from his right hand, the one he blessed me with. My guardian angel said these words to me, Daughter, on this day, Jesus' blessing has showered an abundance of graces upon you. Close quote. How, how did you react when you read these conversations? So reading any of the mystics, it's really, it's so difficult. And I can only imagine the task ahead of them to convey what they're experiencing because it's so out of the realm of the earth, of the earthly, right? These, yeah. these heavenly experiences, it's just like contemplating eternity. We just can't, our little human brains simply don't have the hardware to, <laughs> to fully understand what is going on. But really through, through all of Gemma's visions, just love came through definitely as, as the baseline for all of them the true essence of charity the wanting to be in heaven especially um Gemma would rejoice at the thought that she might die soon to go to heaven and Jesus or our lady would tell her no you still have more to suffer here what whether that's to convert sinners help the souls in purgatory something else you still have to stay here for a while and it's just it's it's the tantalizing taste of something that we we don't understand now and the happiness in heaven that is incomprehensible and to us, which we get, we catch glimpses of time and again. And yeah. whether that be at mass or have it having spiritual experiences, but that we know we'll never be able to fully possess on this earth. So um, it's just for anyone who I know the temptation often arises for people that, Oh, is, is heaven going to be boring or is it going to be worth it? But when you see the, excitement which the saints especially Gemma display for this prospect of eternal union with Jesus and how to get she she would be so sad if Jesus wouldn't come for one day to see her and to know that heaven is that eternal union forever really reinforces that yes obviously heaven is going to be this wonderful incomprehensible love that we can only catch um, glimpses and fragments of now. Yeah, it's that sense of loss when he's not present, that there's just this incredible longing that overtakes everything. And and I just want to get back to the stigmata and how um, there was even a moment there where they wanted to bring doctors in and it would only be revealed to herself and her, her spiritual director and some other priests and other times when others uh, wanted to be able to see this miracle, she even revealed that Christ would withhold it on those weeks. But then there was this other thing where Jesus placed his crown of thorns on her head and she could feel the pains of that mm -hmm. for hours at a time. And then when he would remove it, she would, she would just want that back. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you were reading that stuff? Yeah, it's almost unfathomable to desire this pain and the suffering because it brings union with Jesus. Because for most of us, we have it's a chore to offer things up. Right? We have to say, okay, this is painful. I hate it. Uh, I'm not happy about it, but offer it up like almost begrudgingly. But to get to the point where you're actually craving suffering because it's that intimate union with Jesus is just incredible and very aspirational. And she, yeah, she really displays this really from a young age and then that's why receiving the gift of the stigmata was such an amazing development for her um she was given the stigmata for the last three to four years of her life and uh, those those passages where jesus places on her head the crown of thorns and then comes to remove it at the end i think some of the most beautiful imagery in the book of of him yeah. giving her this cross and uh, being there for her throughout this suffering and and uniting it to his and then personally relieving it, taking it away from her. Um, 
and just that, that personal moment that, that they had when that happened. I also read um, on her website, which is not mentioned in the book, that she had, in addition to the five wounds and the crown of thorns, the gashes in her knees from Jesus's falls on the road to Calvary wow. and just deep, almost to the bone cut. And so you think the, the incredible amount of physical pain on someone who was already suffering mm. such physical pain and how she welcomed this. Uh, it's something that defies all human and natural uh, definitions and expectations, but that's because it's not human or natural. It's supernatural. It comes from God. And it's, it's our job to to mold ourselves to that uh, as crazy and as as difficult and impossible it may seem. Yeah. And for some of the people listening, I mean, they could be saying, wow, this is like all really out there. These are some incredible mystical experiences. And I just, I think what I'd just like to do, it's a bit of a spoiler, but towards the end of the book, it was really satisfying for me to read this passage, which is an incredible act of humility and echoes a lot of other of other great teachers, doctors of the church, like St. Teresa or St. John of the Cross, in terms of humility and attachment. Um, but she writes, quote, Whoever reads these things, I repeat again, should not believe, because they are all my imagination. Nevertheless, I agree to describe everything, because I am bound by obedience Otherwise, I would do differently. Close quote. I, I kind of felt two things when I read that near the end. I was like, whoa, wait. But then I, I realized that uh, obviously the importance of that quote is that in her humility, she could never take credit for one word that was in that book um, mm -hmm. because she was, she was dictating her experiences with God from God. So uh, did you, did you have a sense of that toward when, when, as I read that now or when you read it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was definitely a sign of her deep humility that, and, and not a self doubt, but just a uh, giving of everything to God and, and everything within her power. She, she understood came from God. And this, also reminds me of another book that Sophia just recently re-released called Visions and Revelations by Father um, Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, which deals primarily with St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross and their mystical visions. And it's important to remember that visions are secondary and accidental to the life of faith. And so the reason St. Gemma is a saint is not just because she was given these amazing visions, but also because she practiced heroic virtue and complete abandonment to the will of God. And that's the primary reason in her life. And so whenever she speaks of her own visions, she really displays a true understanding of the church's decrees on where these lay in the spiritual hierarchy of a well-ordered spiritual life. She doesn't consider herself holier than anyone because she was given these. She actually the opposite. She she sees how her sins are magnified because of these. Mm -hmm. And she understands the importance of obedience to her spiritual director and the ability of demons to manipulate the imagination and the intellect with these types of visions. There's one recorded instance I remember from the book where a demon pretends to be her guardian angel at mm -hmm. one point and is telling her lies and, and um, saying just very, very awful things to her to get her to doubt herself and hate herself and hate God. And she realizes this would, this is something he would never say. And at that moment, the demon reveals himself, all of the, the false cities of uh, his disguise fall away. And so she, she really understood this and shows that she was not, in this only because of the special vision she was given, but rather a fidelity to the church. And that was her primary goal. And these visions were a helpful um, secondary thing to supplement her faith, but that she would have been faithful to the church no matter what. Yeah. And it's important to say that while all this was going on, it wasn't publicized. And um, also I think it's very important to uh, talk about how, diligent the Catholic Church is before declaring anybody a saint. Mm -hmm. And really all they're really doing is saying, we can tell you with a high, a very, very, very high degree of certainty 
this person is in heaven and experiencing the beatific vision, which is also very important to remember when we're talking about saints and sanctity. Um, right, that we're not we're not demanded to believe in any personal devotions or revelations, even up to the point of, of the rosary, which was revealed to St. Dominic in in this way, because all true visions, and this is part of this rigorous process, will conform themselves to big R revelation. Mm -hmm. And if they are in any way departing from revelation, public revelation, then that's a sign that it's a false, a false vision or a false revelation. And so um, this is the this, this safety hatch where we have where we're not bound by anyone's private revelation, but as long as they are in concordance with the deposit of faith and what we know to be publicly re revealed, then um, they can serve to inspire various factions of, of Catholics and the church militant, especially depending on um, their state in life and how they can relate to particular saints. The beauty of most of these stories for me and this one is just the love story between our Lord and one person and willing to go on that journey of discovery and to document it for us to read. Uh, St. Gemma gives us an example and maybe just you could repeat again for anyone who's listening what to pray to St. Gemma for and uh, where her sanctity lies. So Gemma is the patron of students, um, let's see, paratroopers, which has an interesting story uh, we can get to, and especially against temptations. That's the one that sticks out the most to me. And that's because she was often assailed by these demons, as we've talked about. And she describes that in everything that they could do and pull against her, including the physical assaults, the pushing her out of bed, the pinching her, the annoying her with their, and just like harassing her with their words. The worst thing that they did was to give her horrific temptations. So temptations against purity and then temptations to despair, all sorts of temptations because a temptation is an invitation to sin. And she rightly understood that sin should be hated and feared more than anything else. And that sin is worse than a demon because sin means that you have employed your will to act against God. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was horrifying to her. The whole concept was just completely horrific as, as it should be to all of us when we have this understanding. And so she could deal with the, the demons yanking her hair and whatever they did, but whenever they tempted her, that was, that was the worst moment for her, but she prevailed. She, at certain points would be aided by her guardian angel, by our Lord himself. Um, another, great saint that appeared to her was referred to in the diary as brother Gabriel. And he is Gabriel of our lady of sorrows, another passionist monk from the local area who was just a venerable, his case for canonization at the time was being considered. And he was another great encouragement in her life who played the same role as, as her guardian angel did with encouraging, but also admonishing her. And he would help protect her from temptation. He would take his belt off of his passionist habit and give it to her. And that would protect her against temptation. And uh, she also had a relic of the true cross that she would wear that would also protect her against these demons assailing her with temptations. Wow. Tell us about the paratroopers. I'm sure there's one or two listening yeah. that really want to know why they should be praying to St. Gemma. <laughs> right. Well, this is a good Italian story. So uh, Gemma was canonized in 1940, I believe. And soon afterward, the Second World War broke out. And an Italian battalion of, I don't know what the word is, for paratroopers, um, prayed to St. Gemma for safety throughout the war. And they went so far as for the local convent to sew into each of their parachutes a relic of St. Gemma. And so during a particular battle or raid, each of them had to, had to jump and they all prayed to St. Gemma. They all emerged unscathed. The most remarkable was one soldier whose parachute did not open the first two times he tried pulling the string. And after he prayed to St. Gemma, it just opened miraculously. And so because of this, she has been granted that title as, as patroness of paratroopers. Wow. What a, a lovely story for us to end on. And I have to thank you again. Uh, we've been speaking with Kristen Van Uden uh, from Sophia Institute Press. The book is The Diary of St. Gemma, a very interesting read. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, David. My pleasure.
Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Our website, thefocusingway.com.